So there's no such thing as drug of abuse. There's you know drugs that can be used more or less problematically depending on you know who's using it in what context and for what intention. Welcome to the Greener Grass Podcast from Bluebird Botanicals. I'm your host, Lex Pelger. Dr. Ken Tupper has been studying psychedelics since 1999, and in that time, he's approached the topic from several different angles. Today, he talks about the linguistics of terms like drug and addict, the relationship between capitalism and psychedelic spiritualism, and the educational value of altered states. Of course, we will also discuss his work as Director of Implementation and Partnerships at the British Columbia Center on Substance Use. We covered so much ground that we could do whole episodes about any one of his many areas of interest. So I know you'll find something memorable in this conversation with Dr. Ken Tupper. This show is brought to you by Bluebird Botanicals to spread education about cannabis and other things on the greener side of life. Bluebird CBD oil comes from farms in southern Colorado and is grown using only water, soil, and sunlight. Go to bluebirdbotanicals.com for more info. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be joined today by Dr. Kenneth Tupper. Thanks for being on the show. Hi, Lex. Thanks. Your title is Director of Implementation and Partnerships at the BC Center of Substance Use and the Adjunct Professor at UBC School of Population and Public Health. And I'm looking at your research. You wear a lot of different hats, and your work takes you in many different directions. And so my first question is, what do you call yourself? Uh, <laughs> it depends on the day and, and the meeting. Um, so I'm an academic to some degree, but I'm working in the health system uh, in sort of implementation of a variety of projects with the BC Centre on Substance Use, um, which is a new health system resource here in British Columbia that started in April of 2017. But prior to that, I was a, a civil servant. I worked in the Ministry of Health in British Columbia uh, for 14 years uh, doing harm reduction and prevention policy uh, in the area of, of illicit drugs. So uh, I kind of draw on, on a policy making or policy involvement hat for, for many years um, in, in my academic research as well. Hmm. To go back to the beginning, what was it that first interested you as a young person? Um, and did you see those interests leading you to all of the work you're doing today? So yeah, I, you know, I became interested in the topic of psychedelics um, in my teens, and I remember reading a book by Aldous Huxley called *Island*, that was sort of very striking in terms of its visionary um, articulation of a, a you know utopian type society that blended elements of Western science, uh, Eastern mysticism, and, and traditional indigenous knowledge practices in a way that was you know very prescient and, um, you know, Aldous Huxley was definitely a, a man ahead of his time. Uh, and that, that book sort of resonated with me in, in terms of the use of a, a fictional mushroom. He called it the moksha medicine. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a psychedelic uh, substance that was used for a variety of purposes in this fictional society, uh, the island Pala. And one of the ways it was used was as a, a sort of tool for learning for rites of passage for young people transitioning into adulthood and and that sort of led to my ultimate graduate studies in in education and both masters and phd developing the concept of entheogenic education as i described it um yeah so that that's sort of the the brief history of my the origins of my areas of interest and and sort of where it where it took me i'm so glad to hear island i i think that it's it's maybe the best blueprint we still have for how these things might look in a in a sane rational way um and it also speaks to it seems like art is very important to you both in your public life and in your private life and it's interesting that island is such a great piece of art that lays out some very important concepts and i was wondering if you'd speak more about how that kind of developed for you through your schooling how art developed for me yeah, how art became a piece of what you do with your work. Sure. Well, I, I mean, the sort of artistic expression that I have most outside of the, I guess, the art of writing an academic paper is uh, is music, where uh, I've been uh, a musician for 
for many years now, um, inspired originally by, by experiences that I had as a, a teenager that got me interested in playing guitar, uh, you know, originally classic rock, but then went into Celtic music and then ultimately into West African guitar. And I played an Afrofusion dance band now. Um, and, and that was, you know, really sort of a, a trajectory of, of my life that um, was inspired in part by uh, experiences that were, um, yeah, entheogenic, for lack of a better term. Yeah, music and entheogens going so far back. Um, and so can you talk more about your PhD dissertation about this concept of entheogenic education? Sure. Well, you know, initially it was a master's thesis at Simon Fraser University in, in Burnaby, British Columbia, where I proposed to do a, a thesis on the topic of psychedelics as educational tools or the educational value of psychedelics. Um, and this was between 1999 and 2002 that I did, I did that. And at the time I was told I was committing career suicide, that this is a crazy topic, you know, even, even if it, there was something to be explored here, maybe as a junior professor, a postdoc, uh, this would be worthy, but, but not as a master's student. Um, you know, I didn't listen to those naysayers uh, in, in the academic department that I was, I was in, but was able to find a few professors who were supportive. There's no real sort of experts in the area of uh, psychedelics and education other than Tom Roberts, who was at University of Northern Illinois at the time. Um, but I, I was able to say to find some supportive uh, professors and ended up uh, writing a, a thesis uh, developing the idea of, of psychedelics or entheogens as cognitive tools. And I, I decided to turn, use the term entheogen um, in large part because the stigma around the word psychedelic uh, was still very much in force at the time. And, um, you know, to talk about the, the, the use of sacred plants in, and the use of the metaphor plant teachers in, in different indigenous contexts uh, in Amazonian ayahuasca drinking cultures, in the peyote uses of, of uh Huichol, for example, um, the use of psilocybin mushrooms by the Mazatec in, in Mexico, all, all of which had this idea of, of learning from the spirits of plants or mushrooms behind them, it was very striking to me, uh, especially in as much as I was aware of the you know, claims in the 1960s of uh, cognitive enhancement or mind expansion or creative inspiration through the use of psychedelics in, in a more modern context. And I really thought there was something to be explored in, in that interface of traditional indigenous knowledge and, and more recent um, countercultural knowledge and, and wanted to sort of develop the idea of, of these types of, of substances uh, to be used for, for non-medical or non-therapeutic benefits. Uh, I was aware of the history of, of therapeutic uses of drugs like LSD, but um, because I was in education, I'd been a teacher um, for a number of years at that point, teaching uh, English as a second language. So um, wanted to, to do my graduate work in this area, but really sort of wanting to, to explore this in, in the world of psychedelics. Um, and so then after finishing my, my master's thesis, went on to do a PhD. Uh, originally I was planning to do my PhD on the uh, idea of drug education from a harm reduction perspective, a, a topic I'm still very much interested in. You know, How do we do school-based drug education when we know that uh, just say no approaches um, aren't evidence-based, the D.A.R.E. program is, is discredited, but what do we do instead? Um, you know, it's, it's a challenging question. So for, for a few years, I, I did a, started my PhD at University of British Columbia. For a few years, was, was focused on that and published a few papers on, on these topics, but ultimately was drawn back to entheogenic education and, and ended up writing my PhD dissertation uh, with the title Ayahuasca, Entheogenic Education and Public Policy. Wow. That is ahead of the curve. Um, and I, I love that twist on it. It's not education on entheogens, but education by entheogens. And I would be curious what it's like for you in the academic world to be talking about you know, ayahuasca as a grandmother teacher and these you know, concepts that aren't as accepted in the, uh, the academy. You know, it was surprisingly, uh, you know, maybe it was because I was on the west coast of Canada, British Columbia, you know, the, the folks that I was working with in, as say, the, the supportive professors that I found uh, and uh, even other students were, were generally open-minded enough to be willing to, to listen 
to what I was trying to claim with, with, you know, thorough research, uh, done in terms of, um, you know, a lot of documentation and, and, um, I, you know, I wasn't able to do anything sort of clinical work or administer compounds to anybody. Um, but you know, my project wasn't so much to do that. It was really to try to lay a theoretical foundation and drawing on contemporary educational and psychological theories to develop the idea of how these types of uh, substances could be beneficial in a cognitive enhancement kind of way. So, uh, most explicitly, I drew on the theories of a Soviet psychologist named Lev Vygotsky, who was big in education um, and, and had the idea of a cognitive tools uh, being sort of important elements in, in educational development. And so I uh, was able to use his theor- theoretical foundation of cognitive tool to apply, you know, arguing that, you know, if we think of psychedelics or, or antigenic plants as, as kinds of cognitive tools, a very instrumentalist way of thinking about them, but one that sort of fits with, um, you know, understanding of potential benefits and harms of, of any kind of tool uh, deriving from how it's being used, with what intention, by whom, in what context, etc. cetera. Um, it, it worked quite well. Interesting. And what uh, cognitive tools was the researcher initially talking about? Oh, so Vygotsky uh, talked about cognitive tools as being things like, uh, his, his the primordial cognitive tool that he described is uh, literacy and, and numeracy, so the you know, advent of reading and writing, which are relatively recent uh, you know, cultural phenomena in the history of human uh, civilization. You know, we've, we've spoken language for you know, hundreds of thousands of years since you know, early hominid ancestors, presumably, but reading and writing is a relatively new technological development in, in human history. Uh, so Vygotsky was very interested in literacy and development of literacy and, and language acquisition or sort of literacy acquisition. Uh, so he, he thought of um, cognitive tools as the interface between mind and matter, things external to us like, like letters and numbers that then can kind of shape our neural architecture. And, and there's been some fascinating research done on uh, literate cultures versus oral cultures. Uh, so cultures that you know didn't have a history of reading and writing, and, and types of sort of cognition um, that individuals from those different cultural settings uh, engage in, just by virtue of the fact that they've learned to read or write versus uh, not having ever been exposed to the concept of reading and writing. And and you know other another example, for example, uh, it would be an abacus. Um, you know, in in Asian cultures, the abacus is a a powerful kind of tool or instrument that actually can rewire neural architecture. There's studies that have shown that in children who learn to use an abacus ultimately don't need to have the abacus, abacus physically, um, you know, beside them to, to be able to sort of rapidly mentally calculate things. They've kind of internalized uh, the use of that tool in a way that uh, has shaped the neural architecture. Or a musical instrument, another example where, uh, you know, regular practice with, with that kind of tool or instrument um, again, shapes neural architecture in a way that um, people become very versatile with, with musical um, expression. Do you have any opinion on the, the so-called stoned ape theory that early human use of psychedelics might have helped to cause the explosion of the early brain and, the, and language to develop? I mean, it's obviously a very appealing theory. I, I believe there's very little evidence for it, uh, you know, archaeologic, archaeologically speaking. Um, so I, I remain agnostic. Uh, you know, if, if someone were to come forward with something a little more solid in terms of you know, trying to demonstrate that it, it might have some validity behind it, um, I'd certainly welcome that. But um, other than that, I think it's, uh, you know, hopeful speculation at, at best. But, you know, it, obviously there's a certain kind of resonance. I mean, there's lots of archaeological evidence that humans have used various types of psychoactive substances since, um, you know, very, very early in our hominid development and in other animals as well, seeking out psychoactive uh, plants in their environment for the purpose of altering consciousness. So there's, you know, I think some, some reasonable, um, reasonable speculative uh, oomph behind it. But uh, yeah, as I say, there's, there's no real evidence as far as I'm aware. Yeah, I think it's a great answer. Hopeful, but what can you do? Um, and it actually speaks to one quote I wanted to read uh, from your website that I thought was really both even-handed and also really far out there um, for someone in the academic world. Um, and you and you write, many of the social and ecological problems that humanity faces in the 21st century seem intractable. 
but I believe that psychedelic plants and substances such as ayahuasca, peyote, psilocybin, LSD, and MDMA may be important tools for helping to solve them. Um, I think that's a really powerful statement and the bravery to put it onto your, um, right onto your website. Um, and what it's like to be, have that right up front as you move through these worlds. Yeah, you know, there's, uh, you know, I think a lot to be uh, hopeful about with respect to psychedelics as both therapeutic tools and and non-therapeutic or I say cognitive enhancement tools. Um, the idea of being better than well, Bob Jesse, uh, for example, speaks, uses that, that phrase that you know, healthy people can uh, become more well or healthier uh, through their circumspect use of, of these types of, of substances. Um, but and, and not just individuals, but I think culturally there may be uh, something to be gained from from this. Um, you know, there was uh, I think in the 1960s some hope that um, you know there would be some transformation on a somewhat unsustainable trajectory that we seem to be on uh, with with so social transformations, um, but you know obviously weren't realized uh, insofar as the use of psychedelics was concerned with the, with the repression of these substances and, and you know, access essentially denied for, for many decades, both to researchers and you know, larger um, sort of public availability, but that there's now emerging scientific evidence that people can become more open-minded, uh, more sort of politically liberal, um, you know, more divergent thinking. Uh, all of these are, are being reported now in sort of latest scientific uh studies on, on the application of psychedelics. And one of the things I think that's really unique about your work is that you don't just focus on the psychedelics, but also on the harm reduction side as well, which you don't see as much. Um, so you're also leading the implementation of a drug check-in program in British Columbia, um, as well as doing research into overdose uh, prevention and fentanyl and things like this. Yeah, so that speaks more to the professional uh, area of, of my um, my work over the past couple of decades. I, I mentioned, you know, having done a master's thesis uh, at SFU, Simon Fraser University, but at that time I also got involved in a group called Dance Safe, which you know come out of the United States, but had set up a chapter in Vancouver, and I, I went out and it's funny because I wasn't into the electronic dance scene at the time. I was a folk musician. I mentioned I was I played music, so. Um, but I heard about this cool drug education project where people go out to rave parties, as they were called at the time, uh, and set up booths to give out information about different drugs from a kind of um, you know, low threshold, um, peer-based model, and uh, give out also condoms and earplugs, and, and then do something called pill testing, uh, as that was known at the time. And I heard about this and thought it sounded appealing. So I, And somebody said, oh, yeah, there's a training happening this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I thought, well, I'll go out Friday night and, and just check it out. And ended up going the whole week, staying for the whole weekend, and, and then ultimately running the chapter in Vancouver for, for the next year and a half, and going out to parties, uh, and when we could, doing pill testing. There was always a bit of a cat and mouse game with with the police, uh, who were always threatening to shut us down, um, and so never really kind of was able to get it off the ground. But through that volunteer work, I met um, people who were active in the harm reduction scene in uh, Vancouver at the time and were planning to open up a supervised injection site. Or we were basically trying to do public education to build support for the idea of a supervised injection site, which ultimately did get established in 2003. So this was just a couple of years prior to that. And uh, I got invited to sort of be part of this, this group that was, was working on, on this public awareness uh, campaign. And through that, met somebody who uh, offered me a job at the Ministry of Health uh, and it was a sort of very fortuitous, classic case of who you know, not what you know, uh, and, and the sort of virtues of, of networking, um, you know, which is always, I guess, a bit of a cliche, um, but for, for young folks in the audience who are, um, you know, thinking about how to find interesting career paths or, or ways to move forward, n never uh, underestimate the, the power of, of making connections that can just kind of accidentally open up doors for you. So yeah, I got into the Ministry of Health and, and then worked for, I say, the next 14 years on, on harm reduction and prevention policy. Um, and at the time, you know, when I went into it, was hope of, hopeful about establishing a drug check or street drug testing is what I called it at the time. Um, 
but never really had the opportunity just because the sort of political winds were never favorable until the last couple of years when uh, the op opioid overdose crisis uh, in British Columbia was declared a public health emergency in April of 2016. Um, although it, and it's not really an overdose crisis, it's actually a poisoning crisis in terms of uh, the fentanyl adulteration of the street opioid supply. So we've, uh, I, I left the Ministry of Health last year to join the BC Centre on Substance Use and we've now established with uh, various uh, grants that we've managed to obtain uh, to, to address this, this public health emergency uh, to establish a pilot street drug checking program. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the evidence behind drug checking is mostly based on party scene, um, people who are using stimulants or, or psychedelics in, in dance music festival settings, etc. But uh, the use, utility of drug checking as applied to a chronic sort of opioid street involved population um, is, is a new thing. So um, it, there's, you know, questions as to how applicable or how useful it's going to be. Um, but I think we've got uh, an interesting pilot pro program to, to uh, evaluate. And certainly the, you know, the, the rationale from a public health perspective is, is pretty sound in terms of uh, the public safety elements. You know, I, I like to make the observation that in the history of public health, after clean drinking water and vaccinations, one of the most important mechanisms of, of protecting uh, the public was the passage of Pure Food and Drugs Acts, which happened around sort of developed countries at the same time, at late 19th and early 20th century, where prior to these pieces of legislation, if you bought a sandwich on the street or a drink at the bar and, and you died, you know, it was, it was too bad for you. You should choose your sandwich dealer more carefully. Uh, there was no there was no protection for consumers through through legislation, but Pure Food and Drugs Acts were passed with the recognition that the governments had an obligation to step in and ensure sort of quality control for for things um, that can be dangerous. Originally, it was you know foods, uh, beverages, and patent medicines as, as they were known at the time. Uh, but now we apply that consumer safety logic to the entire marketplace. So children toys, automobiles, hang gliding equipment. All of this stuff, some of which you know can be dangerous, but uh, you know can th that risk can be minimized through effective quality control uh, over producers and distributors of these types of products. The one area that we leave completely unregulated is psychoactive substances used for non-medical purposes, and and really it's a failure of public health uh, to not recognize uh, that this is an important area of, of consumer safety that um, is you know essentially just you know. We, we uh, I describe it as a kind of um, pernicious logic of allowing people to die preventable deaths in order to serve as a lesson to others not to engage in morally objectionable behavior. Um, you know, an, an equivalency that I've made amused about is, um, you know, somebody who's vegetarian, vegetarian saying that, you know, we should stop testing uh, slaughterhouses and, and or, you know, having quality control over slaughterhouses and testing for E. coli in, in the meat supply uh, just because, you know, people should you know, ha ha suffer the consequences of what can happen if you eat meat. You know, it's, it's a flawed logic. And I bet, I'm sure there's a lot of pushback against street drug testing. Um, but what have you found to be the most effective replies to people who are scared about this kind of activity going on in their backyard? You know, I think the, the openness to doing something innovative like drug checking is uh, you know, a result of a recognition that we are in a public health emergency, that, um, you know, people are dying and that they, they're dying preventable deaths. Uh, you know, a really powerful voice that we're working with at the BC Centre on Substance Use is families who are affected by uh, addictions and, and particularly families and then mothers in particular who've lost loved ones, lost their, their offspring to uh, a drug overdose or in many cases, I say fentanyl adulteration overdose. Uh, and, uh, you know, wondering why uh, their, you know, their loved ones are, are gone and what could have been done to, to protect them. And so there's, a, you know, a, a lobby towards a, a range of harm reduction interventions that are being scaled up in a way that hadn't been so much in the past. So I mentioned Insight, the supervised injection site in Vancouver uh, was established many years ago, but really what not expanded beyond that. Uh, it was a very sort of limited, geographically isolated um intervention that is now the supervised injection is now happening across Canada and a number of different settings 
So that's one example, you know, expansion of opiate agonist treatment or drugs like Suboxone or Methadone or even injectable opiate agonist treatment. So drugs like dicetomorphine, which is known on the street as heroin uh, or, or hydromorphone are being uh, scaled up as well in a more limited way. But it, there's a whole variety of, of things that are happening now as a response to, the, to this crisis um, that, that bodes well for further research and evaluation and, and hopefully bending the, the curve of mortality. Um, it must be amazing to be where you're at. I know all of my friends doing harm reduction in the United States just want to be like Vancouver. That's what they're, that's what the goal is. Um, and it's amazing the number of tools that are being worked on there uh, and legalizing cannabis uh, just a little while ago. Yeah, I mean, cannabis legalization, uh, you know, was was in the works uh, it, partly through expanded medical access in Canada, uh, through uh, sort of court challenges based on human rights arguments. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, the political will emerged to, uh, you know, basically regulate and control the supply of, of something that is, you know, by scientific evidence standards, less harmful than products like alcohol and tobacco. So I think there was a, a building of public consensus that this was the case, and then say finally the political leadership uh, to make it happen. And as a, a researcher, what was it like to actually be there, boots on the ground, doing the types of work that um, volunteer work that got you into this? Being at dance parties, being on the street with injecting uh, injectable drug users, um, it must have been fascinating to see the stories of what's really happening to get a better sense of the, the data and the theories that you're also uh, engrossed in. Yeah. I mean, at the time, I guess when I first got into all of this, I, I didn't, I wasn't sort of thinking about where it was going to take me. I certainly didn't anticipate it was going to take me into public policy and, and sort of much deeper academic research. It was really just you know, doing something interesting and cool at the time um, that, that I kind of you know, accidentally led me to this. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I can, to say that it was, you know, a planned or you know, I sometimes get people asking me, you know, how did, how'd you get kind of the role that you've got or the career that you've managed to create for yourself? And it was not specifically by design. It was really a matter of just, you know, doing something that I was really interested, interested and passionate about and, and then managing to make the right connections and, and have to have the right doors open in front of me and, and be able to walk through them. And I guess, you know, to some bit, to some extent, I guess a bit of courage, like I, I'd say, took on the topic of psychedelics at a time when it was very much, uh, you know, frowned upon or just not, um, you know, looked favorably upon and within the academy and, and got lots of raised eyebrows and I say sometimes even active sort of dissent about the value of what I was doing, um, but didn't, didn't let that deter me. And so I certainly want to encourage uh, folks who are interested in the area of psychedelic research in particular uh, to, you know, think about the, the opportunities that are going to be presenting themselves as further evidence corroborates existing you know, both studies that were done in the 1950s and 60s and then more recent uh, clinical evidence or neuroscientific evidence. I, I think there's just a whole uh, you know, revolution potentially in, in our mental health and addictions systems uh, that's, that's going to be fomented by, by the research that's, that's currently going on and, and is very sort of likely to expand you know, there's a whole range of uh, research teams that are wanting to, to open psychedelic research programs in various uh, academic settings in the United States, Canada, Europe. Um, phase three clinical trials being planned with both psilocybin and MDMA. Um, so there's there's lots of lots of uh, optimism I have for for where the future is going to take us. Nice. And actually, I wanted to hear more about your work and two other organizations that you're involved with, because uh, you're on the Clinical and Scientific Advisory Board for MAPS Canada, who's doing psychedelic research, as well as on the advisory board for the Wasiwaska Research Center in Brazil. And so I was curious what you do with them and what kind of work they're both up to. Uh, so Wasiwaska is a, a retreat center and, and sort, of, um, sort of hub of, of knowledge generation based in Brazil, run by Luis Eduardo Luna, uh, who's a long-term ayahuasca research and anthropologist, uh, originally from Colombia. And he's, um, you know, contemporary of uh, Terence McKenna and, and Dennis McKenna. He met them uh, 
uh, as a young man and became, I think they actually helped him to realize the, the sort of cultural um, background of his own, his own backyard. He hadn't, so he, I think he said he knew about ayahuasca or y- yahe as it was called in Colombia. Um, but it was sort of the, the McKenna brothers who helped him uh, sort of become more, more interested in it and, and ultimately uh, sort of, to develop an academic uh, research program that that is collaborating with uh, you know the the artistic side of course uh, uh, um, Pablo Amaringo uh, was someone with whom Lewis had a partnership and uh, wrote a book called Ayahuasca Visions that incorporated Pablo's art and, and Lewis helped sort of describe what the, the meaning was in a, sort of for a contemporary audience. So that's uh, the Wasiwaska Center, and then Maps Canada is uh, you know its name would. Uh, sort of imply the Canadian branch of uh, the Multidisciplinary Association of uh, Psychedelic Studies. So MAPS Canada is being led by a friend of mine, Mark Hayden, uh, who is uh, you know, a champion of advancing psychedelic research in the Canadian context and working tire- tirelessly to uh, share clinical research findings and, and build networks to uh, encourage students and, and active academics to um, sort of get with programs, so to speak, on, on where psychedelic research is heading. One of the ones I wanted to ask about from your publication list was Capitalism and the Vine. And just some of your thoughts about the ayahuasca plant and what it's like to see the, the growth of tourism around it and the growth of capitalism around it. So yeah, the paper you're referring to is a, a chapter in one of uh, Bia Labate's uh, edited volumes. Uh, the, the title is The Economics of Ayahuasca, Money, Markets, and the Value of the Vine, in, in which I sort of took on some of the questions that I was struggling with around the commodification of a traditional indigenous um, medicine or sacrament, um, you know, something that came from a cultural milieu in which, um, you know, Monetary exchange wasn't even really part of the mix. That you know, traditional indigenous uh, societies that originally were using ayahuasca in the Amazon were doing it in a way that was just not commodified in the way that we understand it today, or at least not overtly commodified in the way we, we see it today. And so, seeing um, the boom in ayahuasca ceremonies um, happening in places like Canada and the United States and in Europe and, and elsewhere. Um, really sort of wondering what the implications were around that. And, and, you know, it was actually uh, some conversations with a colleague of mine at the Ministry of Health who was working in Aboriginal health, uh, who asked me some questions that I didn't have good answers to, um, but inspired me to sort of think more deeply about this was, one of them was, how is drinking ayahuasca different from going to a, a Disneyland or a 3D movie? Uh, you know, she said it, you, it's, it sounds very, like, it's, it fits very well within the sort of Western consumerist mindset. You, you pay your money, you see your pretty colors, and you go back to work Monday morning. Um, and, you know, I, I told her that I'd been to Disneyland and I've been to 3D movies like Avatar, for example, or and that those can be, you know, powerful experiences, but they're different from uh, ayahuasca. And, but that all I had to convince her of that was my testimony and that I understood that that might not be convincing. And there's people who say that, you know, Avatar was a deeply spiritual experience for them or Disneyland was a you know, sort of seminal, sort of wondrous type event in their lives. Um, but that somehow ayahuasca seemed different. But, but as I say, my claiming such wasn't necessarily going to be the persuading argument that I, that I thought it should be. And then also she'd asked, you know, doesn't it profane something sacred to turn it into a commodity for, for just market exchange? Um, you know, and, and she observed that in the cultural traditions that she was immersed in, in, in North American, uh, Indian, for lack of a better word, or First Nations in, in Canada, um, cultures, she said people that she knew who worked with spiritual or sacred type um ceremonial practices or healing practices in, in traditional indigenous knowledge settings typically wouldn't involve monetary exchange uh, or, or you know, very much sort of try to stay clear of that, that it somehow was seen to taint the work that they were doing when, when money got involved. Uh, 
not, not to say there wasn't a reciprocity and that was sort of impl- understood as part of the mix, but she said traditionally, you know, you'd, you'd bring something of value to exchange for getting something of value. Um, it might be a bundle of tobacco or a bundle of corn or chicken or an offer to babysit or, or something, but um, money, she said, people in, in her estimation who are working with integrity typically didn't want money to be involved. And, and then, I, you know, I knew that in the history of, um, you know, Western religions, even Christianity, that money was seen to be uh, sort of problematic in, in some ways, or usury, the, the idea of um, lending money at interest. There's some, some sort of spiritual dimension to it that, that complicated things. So that led me to sort of reflect on, um, you know, how ayahuasca is emerging as a, as a commodity uh, for, for monetary exchange and, and really actually led me down a, a path of interest in, in the history of money itself, uh, the history of global finance, and the relationship between ecology and economy that is fundamentally divorced in a, in a deeply troubling way. I, and I do remember you presenting on that uh, in New York about the history of money. And it was great because everybody was expecting a drug talk and you went down the theory of money rabbit hole. And it was fascinating. Well, <laughs> it was very much a rabbit hole for sure. Like there's lots of uh, twists and turns. And, and yeah, it was, well, you know, I, I never really thought very much about money. You know, what are these pieces of paper and coins that we carry around in our pockets? But, you know, never, I, I never seem to have enough of, but then neither does Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, right? It's like there's this sort of endless desire for more um, that is in some ways interesting in terms of our understanding of addiction. And, and when you think about the uh, root of the word addiction, you know, it wasn't a medical term originally. It, the word addiction comes from ancient Roman law. Uh, and the verb to addict oneself, the root of the word is dictum, which c- c- means speaker to say, but to addict oneself was to assign oneself over into slavery to pay off a debt, uh, yourself or some of yourself and your family, depending on the size of the debt. Uh, and so that, you know, that was the original meaning of addiction. And for, you know, hundreds of years, 17 or 1800 years, that was sort of the, how it sort of stayed an obscure Roman legal term, but it was dusted off in the, in the 18th, 19th centuries as the problematic use of opium and alcohol became uh, more medicalized and a bit of a public health concern and, and that construct of addiction or the idea of enslavement uh, to a substance. And, and this was also the time that slavery was being talked about as a political issue and the abolition movement was, was building. Um, issues of free will and enslavement were very much part of the public zeitgeist. Uh, that, that, that idea of addiction came into existence in, in a medicalized way that hadn't existed prior to that. So, you know, the many illnesses that we deal with were, were known about in antiquity, but addiction was not one of them. In one of your presentations, you cover all the different definitions of the word drug and how imprecise our language can be about that. Can you share the basics of your thoughts on the word drug? Sure. And, and this actually was based on a chapter of uh, my PhD dissertation where, uh, you know, I was challenged by the claim that I kept coming across in, in ayahuasca drinking circles that ayahuasca is not a drug. You know, people would say ayahuasca is a medicine or it's a sacrament or it's a plant teacher, um, but it, it's not a drug. And I was you know, struck by that. It's like, what, what do people mean when they say that? They, they can't mean that it's not a psychoactive substance because clearly it is. <laughs> um, but it, it led me to think about, you know, what does the word drug mean, in fact? And, and so you know, I delved into drawing on, as I mentioned earlier, that I'd been an English teacher. And so I sort of delved into some of the, my knowledge on linguistics and uh, critical discourse analysis to sort of unpack not, not so much the meaning of the word drug, but how the word drug operates in public and political discourses. And, and sort of from that reflection, uh, traced three separate meanings that we associate. Uh, so fundamentally, the, the word drug is polysemic, which is a fancy term in linguistics that means uh, has many meanings. So the word love, for example, if I say I love my wife, I love my mother, and I love chocolate, we understand that I mean something different in each, each instances of the use of the word love there. And the word drug similarly has three distinct meanings that we seldom sort of separate out. And most of us, you know, intuitively understand the differences, but we don't, don't usually separate them out. So one meaning of the word drug is uh, essentially medicine. Uh, when, when you go to the drugstore, it means I go to purchase something that is uh, intended to have some kind of health effect. 
you know, it has an effect on our body. But whether or not it's psychoactive is, is sort of indeterminate or irrelevant. There are some psychoactive medications and there are some non-psychoactive or many more non-psychoactive medications. But when we talk about drugs in that sense, um, that's what we mean. A second meaning of the word drug, of, of course, is bad illegal drug. So when, you know, and this is what we see when the media says, you know, somebody was on drugs. We understand that they weren't taking medications, or at least they weren't taking, uh, you know, uh, they were taking um, substances like aspirin or, or uh, statins or something like that that are non-psychoactive. Um, so, so the second meaning of the word drug is, you know, when we talk about war on drugs or drug dealers, uh, that's what we mean. And then the third meaning of the word drug is uh, just psychoactive substance. So when we say that coffee is a drug, uh, that's what we mean. It's not a medicine. It's not bad and illegal, um, but it's psychoactive. Uh, and that, that means third meaning is actually related to the verb to drug someone, uh, where you know when we talk about drugging someone, we don't mean secretly giving them a medication or, or um necessarily giving them something that's illegal, but something that alters their consciousness and, and you know, maybe renders them unconscious. So as I say, I trace apart those three separate meanings of the word drugs and then uh, focus on, on the second one, the, the sort of bad illegal drugs, and look at the metaphors that are underlying the way that we treat uh, illegal drugs with the, the two dominant metaphors being drugs as demons, meaning that they're kind of like devils that can overtake our, our free will um, and that people who use them are bad and need to be punished, which obviously is sort of the primary metaphor underlying the contemporary global drug policy regime. But then there's also a sort of uh, parallel metaphor that has existed in this weird sort of symbiotic tension, which is drugs as pathogens, uh, meaning that they're kind of like viruses or bacteria, uh, and that people who use them are sick and need to be treated, and that we need to inoculate youth against them. Uh, and that inoculation metaphor is common in the prevention or drug education literature. Uh, so I say that the drugs as demons and the drugs as pathogens metaphors are, are common, but uh, exist in the symbiosis. That must make your job pretty complicated to have all of these different definitions of the word drug floating around and you in the middle of it. Um, well, you know, I don't, it was more, you know, that my reflections on that were more of an academic uh, nature and, and didn't sort of get involved too much in the way I had to deal with, with policy questions um, and, you know, didn't sort of hinder me. I, I sort of have the general understanding of what people mean when they are using the word in, in sort of more loose, loose ways. But I, I felt it was incumbent um, on policymakers to, to be aware of these different meanings. And, and particularly, um, you know, when we use the word drug without kind of recognizing the nuances within that, that label, um, you know, I, I make the equivalency of saying, you know, we're going to create animal policy, thinking somehow that the word animal covers off, you know, everything that or, or recognize that within the word animal exists earthworms, fish, dogs, and human beings, because human beings are animals. And to think that we're going to create a policy that's, you know, going to cover all of those different kinds of creatures, it fails to recognize the, the diversity uh, and that we really need to be more nuanced in our thinking about drugs to just sort of say that, you know, the word drug covers cannabis, LSD, cocaine, uh, you know, fentanyl. Uh, say th those things are, are quite distinct, and, and perhaps our policy deliberations should be more nuanced uh, to reflect that. Hmm. More nuance and more precision in the language around these things. Can I say something else about language? Yes, please. Another uh, term that I think we need to reflect on in, in this sort of uh, discourse around drugs is the term abuse. Uh, drug abuse, substance abuse. Um, you know, the word abuse is is deeply problematic when when you think a little bit more deeply about it. In as much as it's, uh, I characterize it as pseudo scientific, moralizing, and stigmatizing. But you know, you think about the word abuse. It's it's a black and white binary antonym, uh, meaning it's it's kind of like the word day or night or uh, up or down or black or white. It's it, one or the other. There's there's nothing in between. There's no gray area. And, and by international drug control definitions, you know, the United Nations uh, regards use, legitimate use, as, as only medical or scientific use. And anything that's not medical or scientific is by definition of use, which fails to capture the plurality of relationships that both individuals and cultures can have with psychoactive substances. So, so the term abuse just is, is really, really troubling. And we need to think about how stigmatizing 
it, it can be for, for people to call them abusers when, you know, we've got other terms uh, like child abuser or, you know, animal abuser, you know, the, the term, when, when we use the, the term abuse with other phrases in the English language, like child abuse, elder abuse, animal abuse, spousal abuse, in, in each of those phrases that the thing in front of the word abuse is who or what is being harmed. But when it comes to drug abuse, it's, it's not the drugs that are being harmed. So, so you need to, you know, recognize that there's something troubling about, about the word abuse. It, one uh, corollary that comes to mind is in the uh, homelessness activism community, where they, they refer to people not as homeless, but as people who are experiencing homelessness. And that simplicity exactly. of that really is powerful. P- people first or person first language is, is really crucial to recognize the, yeah, the sort of humanity of, of people, even if they're... Uh, in, in more abject circumstances. Um, another, you know, think of the word abuse and, and the phrase that um, is used by, for, for example, the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the United States is the term drugs of abuse, uh, as if it's somehow like an ontological category, a, a sort of pharmacological category or designation of a certain kind of uh, or set of substances, when in fact it's, you know, it's purely socially constructed or politically constructed uh, set of, of, of things that would fall into that. And I, I joke that, you know, saying the term <clears throat> drugs of abuse is like saying uh, a knife of murder, a uh, pen of extortion, or a condom of rape. It, it's confusing a tool with how the tool is being used. So there's no such thing as drug of abuse. There's, you know, drugs that can be used more or less problematically, depending on, you know, who's using it in what context and for what intention. That's true. And another spot where you, um, use that clarity. Um, your Twitter feed, which is excellent, and I recommend anybody interested in these topics to follow. Uh, we'll link to it in episode notes. Um, you often use the acronym PWUD. Um, and what's the importance of using a name like that and, and labels like that in, in work like yours? Well, that actually came out of uh, work that I was doing with people who use drugs. So that's the, the PWUD stands for people who use drugs. Uh, and it was, um, you know, working with, with people who uh, were certainly unhappy or dissatisfied with the term addict, which was you know, typically how people were labeled, um, or even drug user, which you know, emphasized the drugs first and, and really sort of challenging that to say, no, we're people first, we're humans, so let's talk about us as people. Uh, and so that, that acronym is now used more and more in, in academic settings to be respectful of, of, of humanness and um, people-centered nature of, of our work with, with uh, individuals. And, you know, and that the idea of who's a drug user uh, is, needs to be much broader than just you know, people who use certain kinds of drugs. You know, there's people who uh, drink coffee are, are drug users. People who drink alcohol are drug users. People who smoke tobacco are drug users. Uh, people who use various pharmaceutical medications are drug users. But typically we don't think or they don't think of themselves in that regard. And so the last question I usually like to ask people is, if we put you in charge of the thing that you do, how would you lay it out? And it's really cool to be able to ask you because you actually have a paper titled A Public Health-Based Vision for the Management and Regulation of Psychedelics. And so if we could put you in charge of Psychedelic Canada Health Initiative, um, what would the, the outlines of that look like? Sure. Yeah, the, the paper you're referring to was actually co-authored by my, Mark Hayden, who I mentioned with Maps Canada, and a f- former colleague of mine at the Ministry of Health, Dr. Brian Emerson, who's uh, an active uh, member of the Health Officers Council of British Columbia, a group of public health physicians. In, in that paper, we we articulate a post-prohibition model for regulation and control of, of psychedelics, uh, recognizing that you know cannabis is, uh, and we avoid the term legalization just because it's so vague and there's you know so many things that. They, when we talk about legalization, people think typically, you know, we're going to sell these things at, at 7-Eleven to 10-year-old kids. Whereas what we articulate in, in this paper is a, a model that's based on public health principles that recognizes there are potential risks of these of this class of substances, um, but that there's also, uh, you know, failures of prohibition that need to overcome uh, the, the those, those you know, uh, obstacles to, to access for variety of purposes, not just medical, but also spiritual or religious, also even um, cognitive enhancement, uh, and that um, there's policies that we can put in place with, with various kind of um, uh, 
regulatory levers that we can learn from other substances or, or behaviors such as alcohol policy, tobacco policy, now cannabis policy where we've got lessons being learned, gambling, for example. Um, thinking about what kinds of restrictions um, could be put in place. You know, this is not a sort of libertarian, uh, you know, just free for all. It's, it's recognizing that there are, um, let's say, risks and, and potential ways to mitigate them through appropriate mechanisms that don't result don't resort to the blunt instrument of, of criminal justice and, and uh, in law enforcement as, as the primary vehicle for, for trying to allegedly prevent those kinds of harms. Because uh, what we've seen is, a, you know, drug policy, as, as we've seen it in the past number of decades, uh, an abject public policy failure. Well, Dr. Tupper, I very much hope to see you in charge of all of this someday. And I just want to say thank you for taking the time to, to share your thoughts with us. Well, thanks so much for your interest. Greener Grass is a Bluebird Botanicals podcast. Their CBD oil supports a healthy body and a strong endocannabinoid system. They've got friendly customer service who can answer any of your questions, and the number is right there at the top of their webpage. But, per the FDA, they won't be able to make any medical claims for these nutritional supplements. That's also the reason you'll hear little about CBD on this show. There's no need for us to add more evidence about CBD when a simple Google search will give you more than you can read in a month of Sundays. So this show covers the cannabis world and more with editorial freedom from Bluebird Botanicals. Thanks for joining the Greener Grass Podcast. As always, our audio alchemist is Matt Payne. The Gypsy Jazz theme music comes from Brett Van Donsel. Our beautiful bird sounds are courtesy of Lang Elliott. And I'm your host, Lex Pelger, wishing you a bright green day.